Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Zach Drew. And I am Josh Peck. How are you doing, Zach? Hey, I'm doing good. I'll tell you what, we are interviewing a, a friend of mine and a longtime friend of yours. Absolutely. Uh, I'm very excited about this program. Josh and I were having uh, lunch last week, we were, and we were talking about this, this content that our special guest today was going to be going over. And I said, Josh, this is... This is fascinating. I said, I have, I said, I, I'm in this world, but there seems to be like so many bubbles of this world that like don't collide every once in a while. And, and I was so fascinated by being in this world, but yet never hearing the, uh, this subject matter that we're going to be talking about today without giving it away. <laughs> this people group that even wrote things so prophetic about Jesus's first coming, that even the people like the Pharisees and the Sadducees try to hide it mm -hmm. because it would, it, 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 it would nix their authority, so to speak. <laughs> I'm very excited to have this guest with us. I know you are going to be um, just beside yourself with some of the content that we're going to be sharing today. Today's special guest is Derek P. Gilbert. Uh, he hosts the Daily News analysis program five and 10 for Skywatch TV. And he is the author of the groundbreaking books, The Second Coming of Saturn, The Great Inception, and The Day the Earth Stands Still. Authored actually by none other, excuse me, co-authored by none other than our very own Josh Peck. That's right. He's also the co-author with his wife, Sharon K. Gilbert, uh, an amazing woman, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, of Giants, Gods, and Dragons, a fresh take on end times prophecy that identifies the four horsemen of the apocalypse and veneration, which exposes the pagan cult of the dead in ancient Israel. Derek, I am thrilled to have you on the program today. Zach, uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. It's really been a blessing to see you and now Josh uh, alongside and uh, how your ministry has grown. Um, you guys are reaching a, uh, an age group that uh, old people like Sharon and me will not. As Josh likes to point out repeatedly, <laughs> I, began my, uh, I began my broadcast career the same year he was born. Well, Derek, all you got to do is be younger and I'll quit bringing it up. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. All right. So let us, before we even get into these mysterious people that uh, I, I would say in large part, my audience doesn't know them in depth like myself, but this interesting people called the Essenes who are very much in the same category of the Pharisees and Sadducees, but yet they're not mentioned in, in scripture or are they? That's something we're going to be getting to. So before we get into that, let's lay the foundation, Derek, by uh, explaining what exactly are the Dead Sea Scrolls? These were a group of texts that were discovered in 1947 in the desert uh, east of Jerusalem, between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. In fact, you can see from the site of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls a, uh, an ancient community called Qumran, the uh, Dead Sea. It's, it basically was on the shore of the Dead Sea. A, a shepherd in 1947 tossed a stone into a cave, just bored, I guess, and he heard the crash of pottery. Well, being an enterprising young lad, he went in and found that there were scrolls in there, and knowing that there were people willing to pay money for ancient artifacts, he uh, let others know about it, and uh, that led to one of the greatest discoveries of the last century, really, because these texts that were preserved by this religious community at Qumran help give us a window not only into religious thought among the Jews in the first century A.D., but also helps us to confirm the texts of the Old Testament, because there are quite a few of the Old Testament texts that were preserved there. They give us another cross-reference check to confirm that what's in our Bibles today have been accurately preserved for the last 2,000 years. And these people at, you pronounce this city Qumran, mm -hmm. which you've written a book about Qumran. Yep, Lost Prophecies of Qumran. That's right. <laughs> so the people there, were those the Essenes that we were just discussing a moment ago were, who were the Essenes in Jesus's day? They were some of the Essenes. Okay. Now, until Josh's book came out, I was under the impression that all of the Essenes were at Qumran, but I stumbled across some research as I was looking into the actual baptismal site of Jesus, 
which by the way is not where most people think it is, and discovered, or I should say learned, I didn't discover this, that there were Essenes all throughout Judea in the time of Jesus. There were Essenes in Jerusalem, there were Essenes in the north near the Sea of Galilee. And uh, in fact, we know from first century historians Josephus and Philo, Philo of Alexandria, that uh, the Essenes were quite a large community. In fact, Josephus, the Jewish historian who himself was a Pharisee, wrote more about the Essenes than he did about the Pharisees or Sadducees. See, I, and see, and I didn't, I, I, I feel so ignorant because I just didn't know that. Why, why don't we see the word Essene in the Bible? Well, it's because I think people, the, the apostles in the first century may not have found it necessary to mention them by name. Um, I think there's some clues that they are, in fact, in the New Testament. There are three oh. references in the New Testament, one in Matthew 22, verse 16, and two in the Gospel of Mark, Mark 3, 6, and Mark 12, 13. The references to the Herodians, the Herodians, who are always mentioned in the context of the Pharisees, the Herodians may well have been the Essenes. Really? Because as we learn a little bit more about the history of the Jews in the centuries leading up to the birth of Jesus, we discover that the Essenes in the first century BC actually supported Herod the Great in the civil war that took place between ah. the years 40 and 36 BC, when Herod the Great, backed by the Romans, basically captured Jerusalem from Antigonus, who was the son of John Hyrcanus, the last independent ruler of Judea, who was backed by the Parthians, the Persians. So essentially, at Rome and Persia fighting a proxy war over Judea with Herod the Great, backed by Mark Antony, yes, that Mark Antony of Cleopatra fame, and uh, the Essenes were allied with Herod. In fact, there was an Essene we learned from Josephus by the name of Menachem, who prophesied that Herod would come into his kingdom. And according to Josephus, he swatted Herod on the backside so that when uh, uh. Herod became king, he would remember who it was who had <laughs> prophesied it. Now, this was Herod as a young man. He laughed it off. He didn't think it was serious. But later, when he did become the king, with the backing of Rome, of course, uh, he actually invited a group of Essenes to settle in Jerusalem. Uh. And there was a quarter of ancient Jerusalem called the Essene Quarter. Wow. That's so fascinating. And because there's a lot of information in the Bible about the Pharisees and Sadducees, but with the Essenes, how did Essenes belief, what did their beliefs, uh, how did they compare or differ from the Sadducees and the Pharisees? Well, that is really a fascinating history. And so we'll roll through about 400 years of Jewish history here in the next couple of minutes. All yeah. right. <laughs> when, Buckle up. When the Jews returned from Babylon in the fifth century BC, okay, we know that. Uh, Nehemiah was given permission around the year 444 BC by the Persian king Artaxerxes to rebuild the temple. And when the Jews returned, they found that there was a group of Jews who uh, had taken control of the temple. Okay, They, they uh, believed that prophecy had ended with uh, the prophet Malachi and uh, that all that was left was for them to continue to perform their, their priestly duties. And that would uh, gradually cleanse the world to the point that the king from the line of David would come to the throne and restore Israel to its prophesied greatness. There was another group, however, that returned from Babylon and um, believed that they needed to construct the temple prophesied by Ezekiel. That's in Ezekiel chapter 40, 41. And uh, they were under the belief that the world had been so corrupted by the sin of the sons of God, mentioned very briefly in Genesis chapter 6, that only direct intervention by God himself would, would fix the world. So on the one hand, you had the priesthood, call them the Zadokites, named for Zadok, the high priest under the, in the time of David, with the Enochians, on the other hand, so named for the patriarch Enoch, and for whom the book of First Enoch is named, uh, who believed that the sons of God, these watchers who had commingled with human women, had corrupted humanity, not just through their commingling and creating these hybrid uh, giants called the Nephilim, but by teaching us forbidden knowledge. They had so corrupted the earth that God needed to intervene directly. So you had a fundamental conflict there 
between a group that believed God had to intervene directly and another group that said, no, no, we've got this. All we need to do is keep performing the rituals and the rites. This conflict kind of simmered for a couple of centuries. Now, around the year 160 BC, now bear in mind, this follows the, uh, the Maccabee Rebellion, okay? Judas Maccabeus led the rebellion after Antiochus Epiphanes, the Greek king of Syria, desecrated the temple in Jerusalem. He set up an altar, uh, an idol of Zeus in the temple. He sacrificed a pig in the temple, desecrating the temple. The Maccabees rebelled. In the year 160, the successor to Judas Maccabee, uh, Jonathan, came to power, and with him came a high priest who was only known from the Dead Sea Scrolls as the teacher of righteousness. Oh, my. Okay. For, for a period of about eight years, the two of them appear to have been allied, you know, allies in uh, the, uh, the leadership role here. But around the year 152 B.C., once again, foreign intrigue, a, a Greek king by the name of Alexander Ballas offered Jonathan the right to be the high priest in Jerusalem if Jonathan Maccabee would back his play militarily against the king in Damascus. So Jonathan said, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good deal, being king and high priest. Now, Barry, he's not, he was not a Levite. He was not authorized under the law to be the high priest, but he took the, uh, took the deal and so the teacher of righteousness suddenly became persona non grata. So he and his followers fled to Damascus. These were in uh, Syria. They were called the righteous ones or the pious ones, which in, in well, in Hebrew, that's the Hasidim, as in the Hasidic Jews. Now, it's not the Hasidic Jews of today, but that's what the word means, the pious ones. But in Aramaic, that word is Hasin, which in Greek is Essen. That's where the name comes from. So these followers of the teacher of righteousness found themselves exiled to Damascus around the year 130 BC. He dies around the year 100 BC. A group of them decide to relocate back to Judea. Some of them settle at the Sea of Galilee. They were more willing to work with their neighbors and uh, be a part of society. But another group decided to go all the way to the Dead Sea and settle at Qumran because they believed they had to absolutely separate from society completely and follow their rules in order to uh, be perceived as righteous. So again, that is a quick nutshell overview of the history of the Jews. The Pharisees came out of this uh, because when uh, the teacher of righteousness fled to Damascus around the year 152 BC, a group of his followers decided to stay and uh, support Jonathan Maccabee, and they became the Pharisees. So the Pharisees are actually an offshoot of the group that became the Essenes, interestingly enough. And that's why it's not too surprising when we see in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark the Herodians uh, showing up with the Pharisees. It's because they had been political allies for more than a century and a half by that point. Man, that's, that's fascinating. I mean, there's so much rich history there in that 400 years that's usually called the silent years. But with the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can fill in uh, a lot of those gaps. And speaking of which, you mentioned the Book of Enoch. Now, the Book of Enoch was really important to the Essenes. Speaking of the book of Enoch for us Christians today. Is it okay for Christians to, to read it? And should we view the book of Enoch as scripture? How, how do you see the book of Enoch? Well, it, it's not in the Bible and it's not in the Bible for good reasons. There are some weird things in the what we call the book of Enoch is actually the book of first Enoch. There's a second Enoch and a third Enoch that were written well into the Christian era. So they're not really relevant to us as Christians. But the book of Enoch, the book of first Enoch more properly, uh, does contain a lot of doctrine that shows up in the New Testament. But there are also some contradictory chapters and some things that just are, are really fanciful, really far out. So it is not really Scripture in that regard. H having said that, the various sections of the Book of Enoch are really important. The first 36 chapters, which are called the, uh, uh, the Book of the Watchers, kind of explains the sin of those sons of God from Genesis chapter 6. And that was clearly known to... The apostles, for example, both Peter and Jude make reference to angels who sinned, who are in chains in gloomy darkness. Now, there are no references in the Old Testament anywhere of that, but that is made explicit in First Enoch, those first 30 
66 chapters called the Book of the Watchers. That was completed by about the year 200 BC, probably written in the north of uh, Judea, the upper Galilee, the region between the Sea of Galilee and uh, Mount Hermon, which according to the Book of Enoch is where the uh, sons of God gathered to uh, plan their rebellion. The next section, chapters 37 to 71, is called the Book of Parables. And this section was probably completed, according to scholars, and this is new research, by the way, just completed within the last year and a half, probably completed by about the time of the death of Herod the Great. In other words, just before the births of John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth. And in that section, we see a prophecy of a a divine agent of God's judgment called the Chosen One, the Anointed One, but most frequently, the Son of Man, which is a term that Jesus applied to himself nearly 80 times in the New Testament. So yes, there are very important doctrines in the book of Enoch that are manifest and confirmed by Jesus himself, Jesus and the apostles in the New Testament. Um, And so from that standpoint, reading the book of Enoch is really helpful to understanding Christian doctrine. So maybe I'm wrong here. So we've established, you know, in the New Testament, we have the Pharisees that are talked about often, the Sadducees, and and it, it seems like the Essenes, uh, you know, it's like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they didn't want to have any part with the Essenes, probably because of some of the prophecies, maybe concerning Jesus. What did the Essenes believe about the coming Messiah? And more importantly, were their prophecies accurate? Yes, and uh, Josh and uh, Ken Johnson in their books about the prophecies at Qumran are really stunning in their accuracy. Tom Horn has gone so far as to say that he believes the Essenes were the most accurate prophets prophets of the second coming of Messiah in, That's a in statement. history. Yeah, it, it, it truly is. But um, what we find among the Essenes is this growing belief um, that the Messiah would arrive, this Son of Man would arrive and punish the wicked angels. And Azazel is mentioned specifically, singled out specifically for punishment in this second section of the book of Enoch, the book of parables, because of the teachings that he brought to humanity, the uh, forbidden knowledge that he shared with us, uh, that wicked kings, evil landlords would also be uh, would also be punished. But there's one other doctrine that was really surprising, and this really separates this group of Essenes who lived north yeah, in the north, near the Sea of Galilee, near the town of Magdala specifically, where Mary Magdalene came from. It's on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. That separates that group of Essenes from the group at Qumran. Now remember, that group split into two, the group that settled in the north uh, around 100 BC and the other group that established the community at Qumran. The group at Qumran, you had to separate from civilization and follow their rules. There was a three-year probationary period before you could even become a member of the community. In the North, they weren't quite as strict about that, but the new doctrine that shows up in that second section of the Book of Enoch called the Book of Parables, which has not been found at Qumran, by the way, which is why scholars believe that the group at Qumran did not write it, was this idea that you could be forgiven through repenting. Oh my. Now, this is not, this was not in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you had to follow the law The Pharisees and the Sadducees also believed you had to follow the law. I mean, that's why we have that adjective called Pharisaical. If you're a Pharisee, it's you believe you've got to follow rules in order to be saved. As Christians, we know that repentance leads to forgiveness through the grace of Jesus Christ. Repentance uh, comes, I mean, salvation comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, but it begins with repenting of your sins. John taught this. John the Baptist probably a member of this Essene community oh. in the north, because whoa, whoa, he whoa, taught... Whoa, 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 you, whoa. Did you just say that John the Baptist, one of the largest New Testament figures other than Jesus and Paul the Apostle, likely, John the Baptist was likely a, a member of the Essenes? Very likely. Very likely. And that is... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and and, what, and what was his message? Right? Well, his message, again, was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, which again was a totally new doctrine, which is why you had the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees sending agents from Jerusalem to find out what he was doing. And I believe, based on the clues, the geographic clues in chapter one of the Gospel of John, 
that John the baptizer was working north of the Sea of Galilee, not down near Jericho where the United Nations says, because the according to John uh, chapter 1, he these things happened in Bethany across the Jordan. But there is no Bethany east of the Jordan River. The only Bethany in the Holy Land is the one on the Mount of Olives. No, the Greek word Bethania is a transliteration of the first century Latin name Botania, which is Bashan. Bashan across the Jordan, which is north of the Sea of Galilee, which is exactly the region where this group of Essenes at the city of Magdala, you can see, you can see Jesus' base of operations at Capernaum. You can see the city of, uh, uh, that with the home city of Bethsaida, of Peter, Philip, and Andrew from the Essene community at Magdala. So just picture this again, this group of Essenes, think of them as a group of monks living on the shore of the Sea of Galilee on this mountain called Mount Arbel, overlooking the Sea of Galilee, creating this document just in time for John and Jesus to be born in the same area where Jesus later based his ministry, where he probably was baptized by John and where John took an aspect of their new teaching that you could be forgiven of your sins by repenting. Yeah, again, the silent centuries were not so silent after all, and the Essenes played a crucial role in all of that. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you, did the Essenes influence the New Testament? And I think I just got my answer. That is fascinating. I I swear, I I tell people all the time that Josh Peck is a genius, so is his buddy Derek. You know, I don't know how you guys get into (laughs) your guys' club, but I'm sure the, you know... uh, one of the biggest things you have to have an IQ of 175 plus or something crazy like that. (laughs) So uh, let us continue with this. This, that was, that was awesome. Um, That needs to be cut up into clips. Oh, definitely. Right there. I mean, as well as the whole show. That was awesome. So what, so what ended up happening? What happened to the Essenes? Where did they, where did they go? Well, I think the Essenes became the, uh, the early Christian church. Of course. <laughs> well, wow. isn't that amazing? We come from the Essenes. That makes sense. We come from the Essenes. Wow. Isn't that amazing? That is awesome. Amazing stuff. I love it. So uh, so why do you believe the Essenes uh, left behind the Dead Sea Scroll? Well, they were recording all of that information to preserve their religious texts for themselves. They did not foresee that um, the the Jewish revolt in the year 67 AD would lead to the, their destruction. Uh, the community actually suffered a, a, a big setback during a, a rebellion just after the death of Herod the Great. There was a, a rebel who uh, uh, rose up, led an army, and destroyed a number of cities in the Jordan River Valley, including Qumran. There really aren't any new texts that came out of the Qumran community in the first century AD. So, um, while they rebuilt, we, it's not clear that they wrote anything more. But again, I think they were just uh, librarians. They were trying to preserve the religious texts that were central to their faith. It's probable that the Essenes in the north at the Sea of Galilee did the same thing. But the uh, the humidity in the air because of the Sea of Galilee probably meant that all of those papyri just disintegrated over the centuries. Mm -hmm. So now that we have access to those documents today and knowing that uh, we likely come from the Essenes because those were the people that accepted Jesus, they knew what to look for, and they took the Great Commission seriously, how should we as Christians today view the Essenes? Should we try and adopt their lifestyle just or just view them as like a historical curiosity or, or something else entirely? Good question. Well, I think it's good to understand the history of the faith and where we came from, but I don't think we need to go back to uh, their their rules and regulations. Uh, again, even the Essenes in the north were pretty strict on their, um, uh, their, for example, their purity laws. One of the reasons they've identified this group of caves, I mean, believe it or not, these guys were living in caves on the north face of Mount Arbel which they had to access through rope ladders. These guys really were monks. And some of them were were even, you know, covered in camel hair and eating locusts and wild honey. Well, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Uh, So, but they they found a number of mikvot, you know, far more than would be necessary for a typical Jewish community among that group because their purity laws were very strict. So, no, we don't need to go back to living under their rules, but understanding that they played a role, that God revealed enough to them 
to prepare the ground for the ministry of John the Baptist and then the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, I think is really important. Amen. That's what a fascinating interview, Derek. I appreciate your time. And listen, I think that there was something planned for the Paul Revere Club oh, yeah. as well. Thank you for reminding me. So uh, those of you who sign up for the Paul Revere Report, which you can only get through the Paul Revere Club at ZachDrewShow.com, make sure you click on the IGBY store icon and get the Paul Revere uh, a membership to the Paul Revere Club. You're actually going to get an extra bonus written interview uh, from Derek Gilbert that you'll be able to read from the comfort of your own home in an interactive PDF that goes even deeper into this topic. So if you're interested in that, once again, ZachDrewShow.com, click the IGBY store icon and sign up for the Paul Revere Club today. Uh, listen, Derek, uh, once again, fascinating um, interview. And I, I, I understand that we're actually just scratching the surface of all of this as well. Where can my audience, where can they find you? Um, and give them a, and give them a, a uh, resource of, what they should buy right now and where they can purchase that material. Well, you can find all of our, the work that Sharon and I do at gilberthouse.org, gilberthouse.org. We're in the process of putting together a, uh, I guess I'd call it a, do not quite a documentary, more of a travel argumentary on our recent visit to Israel, where we show that uh, region in the north of Israel and why we refer to that area between the Sea of Galilee and Mount Hermon as the Valley of the Shadow of Death. We think we've identified that as a literal place. And this discussion that we've had regarding the Essenes and uh, the ministry of John the Baptist plays into all of that. In fact, we believe that the location of Jesus' baptism is directly below a megalithic site <laughs> that nobody knows about, not even in Israel, uh, that's less than half a mile from the... Uh, hometown of Peter, Andrew, and Philip, Bethsaida. Oh, my. Are you doing, I just got to ask you, are you doing another tour to Israel anytime soon? We're going back uh, next, uh, early next April. We'll be there March 31st through April 9th. Our special guest is Timothy Albarino. And uh, we will be taking people to some of these megalithic sites like Gilgal Rephaim, uh, the Wheel of Giants, the Serpent Mound of Bashan. We also are hoping to take people to a uh, location at the north end of this valley, between the Sea of Galilee and Mount Hermon, where there is a dolmen field. Dolmens are ancient megalithic funerary monuments uh, that includes a capstone, a capstone that weighs 50 tons. And we'll explain why that's all biblically relevant and why it relates to identifying that valley as the Valley of the Shadow of Death. So if you're interested in that, how can they find out a little bit more info or where to sign up for that, Derek? We've got information at our website, gilberthouse.org, or you can go directly to the website, gilbertsinisrael.com, gilbertsinisrael.com. Okay. Once again, Derek, thank you so much. We're going to have to have you back. Anytime. It's my honor. Thank you, Zach. Thank you.